You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Artificial intelligence. Making machines that can think like humans. Being able to do things that are considered smart. You know, we've had some forms of artificial intelligence for a while. we got your smartphone, your smart TV, virtual assistant technologies like Alexa or Siri, vehicle navigation technologies are all things that we use daily. And, of course, artificial intelligence is playing a larger and larger role both in our personal and our professional worlds. What is the impact of artificial intelligence And where is the technology headed? Today, I'm very, very excited to have Dr. Lynn Parker with us. She is UT Associate Vice Chancellor and Director of the AI Tennessee Initiative. Now, prior to that role, she led national artificial intelligence policy efforts for four years in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, serving as Deputy, Deputy Chief Technology Offer of the United States, Founding Director of the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Office, and Assistant Director for AI. She also served as co-chair of the congressionally directed National AI Research Resource Task Force. Good morning, Dr. Parker. Welcome to More Living. Good morning. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. That's quite a list of experience there. So you've been quite involved in artificial intelligence for a while. What got you started in artificial intelligence? I have been in in AI since the 80s, actually. It's an area that I've been passionate about. You know, for me, it's about how can you build machines in a way that is similar to uh, how humans are able to think and uh, solve problems. And it's just such a challenge to me and fascinating. So I've just been thrilled to have a career to study this area. So how would you define what is AI? In a nutshell, I think AI is software that enables machines uh, to do tasks that traditionally you think require human-level intelligence. Now, not everybody agrees on a common definition, but I think that's a good working definition. Well, and in fact, it's been pretty recently there's been maybe a turn in that world, right? Because, you know, where computers can solve problems that normally would require reason, the, the, the data's not programmed in there. That's right. Machine learning is a subfield of AI, a very uh, big and important subfield of AI. And machine learning has become more practical today. And that's why we're now seeing AI impacting all kinds of disciplines in all of the economic sectors is because we have lots and lots of data. We have fast computers and we have good algorithms. And so it's very practical today. Well, technology really has evolved throughout all of human history. I mean, we had big milestones like being able to create fire. And then, of course, we had the wheel. We had the industrial revolution, cars, human flight, then to computers, then the way we interface with our computers and now AI. What are some of the most common uses of AI technology that we see in our daily lives and we may not really think about it? Yeah, AI has, has in fact, been around in a lot of the devices that we use. Um, If you think about Google Maps or other kinds of mapping tools, those are using AI algorithms to figure out how to get you most efficiently from point A to point B. Um, You know, we all use Siri, which is a natural language processing on our phones, and that is all about AI. 
Um, you think about tools like Google Translate that are helping people that don't speak the same language to communicate with each other. That is most definitely AI. Um, it's also being used in, in the medical profession, for instance. Um, there are tools now to help medical professionals to be able to um, evaluate images like CT scans or MRI scans and help to find anomalies or areas that n might need to have further attention by, by the doctor. Um, you think about your car and the driver assist uh, capabilities of being able to um, uh, stay in the lane, um, those lane keeping or, um, uh, or the, any kind of those driver assist capabilities are all based on, on AI. So there are just, if you think about fraud detection, say, in your credit card um, and the, the ability of those credit card companies to flag a transaction that doesn't look like it was you or it doesn't fa fit the pattern of you and your purchases that you made in the past, and it will flag you, you'll get an alert of some sort. All of yeah. it's AI. That's fascinating because some of those things I wasn't thinking about. Uh, you know, it's interesting, our cars. I got a car, uh, I got a new car not a year and a half ago. And with the driver assistance stuff, it has this thing where if it senses you're going to hit something, it stops the car. And I learned when you're crossing traffic, like when I'm turning left mm -hmm. across a lane or two of traffic, not to turn that steering wheel too quick. The first time it slammed, it was almost like I'd hit a, you know, a brick wall or something. Yeah. Um, wh where's that line between... And I know it's changing and it's going to evolve, but where's that line between what the computer can do and when it needs that human touch? Yeah. and You mentioned doctors, MRIs. Yeah. You know, where's that line? I mean, it, you know. I think the line is moving, frankly, but I think right now there are a lot of kinds of decisions that require some subjectivity or some deep knowledge about the domain. So uh, we talk about the medical applications. So there, um, an AI system can, can flag something, but it takes the, the deep expertise and knowledge and experience of a medical doctor to know for sure whether that's something that should be of concern or not. And so I think if you think about any kind of uh, task that requires that deep domain knowledge or a task that requires some common sense, AI is really bad at common sense right now. Um, and so doing something that um, may just seem... My, my wife would say that's me, but... <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of people, <laughs> a, a lot of people don't have good common sense either. But um, there are um, those kinds of tasks where AI is just not well, well suited. So hmm. I think of AI right now as a tool. It can help us do our jobs better, but I don't think it's going to be replacing us anytime soon for... For, for most kinds of what jobs. are some common misperceptions about AI well I think if you look at the a lot of the media discussion today around AI it's it's very scary um, you know there's some people talking about how AI may take away all of our jobs and there's data and a lot of informed studies that have looked at this and have said you know AI will be impacting our jobs but impacting doesn't mean taking them away. So as an example, um, if you think about your anybody's job, your job typically consists of a lot of tasks. Um, AI might be able to automate one or two of those tasks, and so now you're using AI as a tool within your job, but it's not, you're not, in, your entire job is not going away. And so I think there's a common misconception that, that AI is just going to make it so that we won't have anything to do. <laughs> Maybe some people would like that, but I, it's not taking, I, I don't believe it's going to be taking away our job. Well, I think when, I mean, AIs can be, is, it, it is and has been and will be ter very disruptive. Yes. Right. And anytime we have new ta technology that is disruptive, I think it's bound to make people uneasy, right? Because it's just new and so disruptive, and we're not sure where that would go. Agreed. And and so um, the disruption means that we need to have new education and training and workforce development opportunities so that people know how to use AI in their jobs as a tool. That's one of the things that, that we've been focusing on at UT is providing that education 
uh, foundation for students about what AI is, what we call AI literacy. It doesn't mean you have to be able to go and, and build um, a new AI system or be able to program it. But what it does mean is that you need to have some literacy or knowledge about AI, meaning what what is AI? What can it do? What can't it do? What should it do or what shouldn't it do? What are some maybe some of the ethical questions around it so that we can now be empowered uh, to to have a an understanding of what AI is and how it might be used in a in a particular kind of job, but that disruption is important. Um, we we can't just um, continue to do what we've been doing and say that it's all going to be okay because our jobs won't go away. Um, you know, often I, I say it's probably not AI that's going to take your job, but it's someone who understands AI is going to take your job. So it's the the need to have that AI. Stay out in front and adapt and evolve and exactly. all those things. Exactly. Not be too stuck. We're visiting with Dr. Lynn Parker. She's from over at the University of Tennessee. She also served four years in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. We're talking about the impact of artificial intelligence. When we come back, I'm going to talk about kind of some of the common things you hear. Should you be worried about this or should you be excited about that? We're going to really kind of dive into some of those things. So stay with us. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. This is More Living with Jim Brogan. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan, and we're talking about artificial intelligence. I've been very excited about this show for a while. Uh, let's talk about what it is, what it isn't, what are some of the myths, what are some of the realities. It is a way of, it is here. How's, how do we need to adapt? Our guest this morning is Dr. Lynn Parker. She's UT Associate Vice Chancellor and Director of the AI Tennessee Initiative. Uh, she was also Founding Director of the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Office. Uh, and it's just, uh, just on and on and on with her background of what she's been involved in. Uh, Dr. Parker, one concern. Okay, so people ask, you know, we, 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 we sit around, we talk about this with our friends. But, you know, we'll be sitting there talking about something. Let's talk, let's say we're talking about running or running shoes. And all of a sudden we start getting ads on our phones for running shoes. Um, so the, the question then becomes who or what is actually listening to us? So is someone listening in on our conversations? I think it depends on the particular application. Um, there is more and more of a sense now that we want our privacy protected. And so I think companies are certainly becoming more sensitive to these concerns. And many of the companies are providing a, an option for you to turn off that tailored feedback or those tailored ads so that now you can just get just random ads as opposed to ads that are tailored to you and your preferences or your past shopping history. I agree. It's really spooky when you go searching for something and then the next time you open up a different app, it now seems to know that you were searching for something, you know, like a pair of running shoes, as you say. So I think it it well, well, it's it's freaky when you're visiting a website and then you go somewhere else, but it's really freaky when all you're doing is talking to somebody else about it, and all of a sudden you see things on your phone. But I guess because, or, or is that a misnomer, but it seems like Siri or Alexa is listening to us, right? Because we can always go, hey, Siri. Uh, so it is. It's always on. Um, I think, you know, we'd have to go, you know, that's what all those very many <laughs> pages of data use agreements for each of those applications tells you exactly how the data is being used. I think there is more of a sense now that um, that that is my phone just talked to me because it I, heard me say hey siri, siri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know oh gracious i'm sorry go ahead a, a, a perfect example it's listening uh but is the information or is the data actually going to a company is it going into a database there are some of these ai systems where the data that is provided to the system is being used to help train and improve the system 
But as I say, there's more and more recognition by the companies that this is a highly sensitive topic. And, and so there are more uh, controls that companies are putting on themselves in terms of where your data actually goes and, and whether or not you can kind of turn off the ability of, of sharing that data. Sometimes if you go into a new application, um, particularly on your phone, there will be a, a, a flag there, a, an, an option there for you to say whether or not to share your data with the company. Perhaps it'll often say to improve the services, but you have the option option of turning that off. So that means that the data does not go beyond your phone. So it's different for different applications. I think in general, when you're talking to your friends, uh, you know, Siri's not spying on you and, and giving that information to some other app. I think it just, it happens to be kind of a coincidence in some cases that gives you that impression. But that's not to say that we really need in this country, we need something more like a comprehensive private data privacy um, oversight or even regulation, a policy of some sort so that we can all be confident that our data is being used responsibly. Now, chat GPT had 1 million users within the first five days of being available. What is chat GPT and how are people using the technology? So chat GPT came out, um, Almost a year ago, a little less than that, and it is what's called in, in technical terms a large language model and generative AI. So what does that mean? It means generative AI means that the AI is able to generate new examples of something that is, are based on prior data. Um, and what it, ChatGPT is able to do is to generate new language, new interactions with you. It can generate poetry or uh, scripts for TV shows or um, just examples of an abstract maybe for a talk you might want to give. Or it can give you a, an idea of a recipe for something that you want. Anything that's based around language, it can create, it can interact with you to create new I, new um text that fulfills what your query is. Um, In technical terms, what it's doing is it has learned from the data that is across the internet, and it is finding common patterns of um, if you say um, a, a particular statement, what is commonly following that statement in all of the internet data that's out there. And so it essentially is able to create something that seems very realistic, new text that's very realistic, um, but it's very much based on training. And so people are using it now to do things like creative brainstorming on on, on topics or to find out information. What ChatGPT, though, is not suited for, and, and if you look at the fine print, it will be very clear that it is not there to give you factual information. It's there um, primarily to provide some creative text that, that hmm. might be useful to you. It's based on factual information on the Internet, but it it's, it's commonly does things like that are called hallucination, which means it's confidently making things up. So you have to be careful in how you use it. How does that happen? I mean, what? How does that work? If, if it makes something up, can you provide an example? I mean, what? How does? How would it make something up? Well, so uh, you know, as an example, you might say, um, you know, what what was uh, Tennessee football's uh, greatest accomplishment? You know, national championship. Uh, accomplishments or something like that and it may go out there and 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 pick well 1998 was a good year and such and such was a good year it was coached by you know somebody else and it would come up with a story that would say oh and you know UT won the national championship 15 years in a row back in whatever year and it would just be um completely Hmm. false so you have to verify the kind of information. So that especially facts you. and data. Facts and data have to be verified. Hmm. But this is a free tool. Anybody can go out and explore it. And so I encourage people to go and just explore for themselves. That's kind of the best way to learn about what it can do. Yeah, the first time I saw it, I was uh, I was visiting my daughter who was a senior in college. Now, she graduated in uh, the end of April this past spring. But I went and visited her, and she was helping us. She, she works part-time for my company, Brogan Financial. She, he, she, she helps us with digital marketing, actually. And uh, we were brainstorming for the bit, my business, and she started using ChatGPT. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's unbelievable. 
<laughs> I couldn't believe it. But it's kind of controversial, too. So let's talk about education. Like, she was learning to use it in school, but then there are concerns with how it can be abused and kids don't actually do the work. They lean on the chat GPT. How is it being used in the education sector, particularly K through 12? And what are some of the dangers there? Well, some of the dangers, in fact, are if, if an, a, an, a teacher assigns a, a student a, an assignment to, say, write a paragraph about the American Civil War, um, then you can go to ChatGPT and say, write a paragraph about the American Civil War, and it'll give you a paragraph, and then the student could just turn that in. Um, now, the so there is a danger of, of cheating in the sense that the student – the only thing they had to do was to put a prompt into chat GPT and they got an answer and they just turned it in. Um, it won't work um, very well um, for the reason that I just mentioned in that the data is not always accurate. And so what can happen then is that students are, are turning in material that, that is just completely senseless. Um, but beyond that, um, Students may not be learning those skills that are needed for creative writing, um, how to put facts and information together, and so forth. And so I think the educational community is coming to a bit of a consensus, I think. I think we'll probably land at a consensus which says that this is a tool that's here. Um, you can't put it back in the box. It's kind of like a calculator. You know, you can't just take away a calculator forevermore. And so um, what we need to do is to teach students how to use these tools in a way that um, advances their critical thinking skills and other learning outcomes that you want to achieve in whatever the class is. So what some instructors are now learning to do, you have to rede redesign assignments so that it, it uh, enables the student to use the, these chat GPT tools to learn about them, but then also to incorporate critical learning and critical thinking skills in that. So, for instance, you could um, create an assignment that says um, uh, create a paragraph about the American Civil War that focuses on the particular aspects of it that we discussed in class. Well, ChatGPT is not going to know what you discussed in class. And so that means in the, it's... So it's not linked into Siri or Alexa. No, I'm kidding. Because <laughs> we were talking about that a minute ago. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not. Uh, I mean, it could... It's not listening in on us. Uh, it, it could be, you know. I mean, you could all... A human could always set it up to do that. But... Um, but the important thing, I think, is that um, it, it puts the onus back on the instructors to design assignments in a different way so that student, knowing that students have access to ChatGPT, you're still able to achieve those learning outcomes with that. Access. Well, and even at the institutional level, figuring out how can we apply this, and then the teachers have to do it too. But it just seems like a it, it's a disruption, so it's got to be – adapted to and figure out how do we get ahead of this and use it effectively uh, we're visiting with dr lynn parker we're talking about artificial intelligence just fascinating stuff when we come back we're going to have more with her we're going to talk about things like self-driving cars and we're going to get into business application profitability for businesses what does that mean for the economy what about job creation or job deletion We'll get into all of that with Dr. Parker. We're also going to have our dollars and cents segment. What is the impact of unretiring? We're seeing more and more people unretire. So stay. Well, that'll be our dollars and cents segment. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and we're visiting with Dr. Lynn Parker, various distinguished guest uh, who's over at the University of Tennessee, been working in artificial intelligence for most of her career. It's just fascinating to talk about some of these things. Before we get back with Dr. Parker, however, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? 
the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan in our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. With a longer life expectancy that we see today, the idea of retiring at 65 or earlier may be out of step with what today's retirees need, either financially or emotionally. You know, retirement could last several decades now. And so a growing trend that we're seeing more and more, and I've been talking about more and more, is the idea of unretirement. T. Rowe Price published a report this week showing that a survey they did of retirees today, 20% of retirees surveyed already work at least part-time, while another 7% are looking for work opportunities. And they're kind of split pretty evenly among those who want to work some to boost their finances and those that want to work for social or emotional benefits. And so this is becoming more and more prevalent. It's also interesting because the data shows us people say when they want to, that, oh, I'm going to work till I'm 70. And the data says that they don't on average work till they're 70. People that say that don't actually get to 70. Now, some of that is lifestyle oriented. Some of that is their choice. Some of it is being forced into early retirement. And that's happening some too. But the idea of unretiring, even if it's just part-time work, can be a tremendous boon to your quality of life. Number one, it can make a huge impact financially. You know, how much you need to withdraw from your life savings in that first five years of retirement or what happens to your money in those first five years. That's why I've talked a lot about the, the market risk, you know, that you inherit if there's a big downturn in the first five years of retirement could be devastating if you don't have a plan to deal with it. Well, likewise, if you just work part-time for a couple of years or three years when you first retire, and it means you don't have to draw much from your savings, or you can put Social Security off a little bit longer because you get those 8% per year increases in your Social Security benefit when you delay your benefit from full retirement age to age 70. There can be so many things that can have a positive impact. And those first five years are so critically important if we look at the numbers that anything you can do to help with that can make a tremendous financial impact. Now, then there's the social and emotional benefits. You know, some people retire. My dad was like this. He retired. He worked till he was 70. And he retired, and he was always identified. He always through his kids, which we grew up and moved away, and through his work. And so when he retired, you know, he just didn't have the social interactions, the passions, the different things that, you t- you know, that you have when you're working. And, and those things are, those emotional and social connections are extremely important. So there are just a lot of benefits, both financially and quality of life, to considering unretiring. Or if you're near retirement yourself, considering part-time work. Maybe you're a consultant. Maybe you work at the golf course two days a week as a marshal. And now you, maybe you get free golf that way when, you, when you're not working. There are just all kinds of things that you can do. So uh, it's becoming much, much more prevalent. And with people living longer and longer lives, doing some kind of work for both income and for social and emotional well-being Past age 65 should be a very strong consideration. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting broganfinancial.com. 
Please visit us online at BroganFinancial.com. You can get all of our podcasts. You can listen podcast them right there on our website. If you click on radio, you can also go to your Apple podcast or Spotify, type in More Living with Jim Brogan. You can download all of our podcasts uh, of our shows. Also, our dollars and cents segments, like I just did, they're, they're also podcast on there, little four- to five-minute tips. So just go to our website, click on radio, BroganFinancial.com, click on radio, and uh, we, you know, our, my goal is to equip you with knowledge. You can make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life in a positive way. Now, this morning we're talking, we're talking about artificial intelligence and we're visiting with Dr. Lynn Parker from over at the university of Tennessee. She also served in Washington DC for six years, uh, worked at the white house, uh, just has just tremendous experience and credentials and we've been kind of diving into this world that we live in and where we may be headed. Let's let's talk, Dr. Parker, about self-driving cars. Um, seems like it's a thing of the future. There are car models now that can park themselves. Many can even be controlled by a mobile phone. Some of them can come pick you up in the parking lot. Um, there's been a lot of speculation. Where will we be in seven or eight years how safe is it? Where will we be with self-driving cars? What do you see in the future? Um, you know, it, on the one hand, it's innovative and it's exciting. On another hand, it's kind of scary. Where Where do you see this going and how how quickly? I think good applications for self, um, sort of driverless cars, self-driving cars, are applications where the terrain, the the environment, the community is very well known, very well mapped out, and does not have a lot of unexpected things like construction that might come along, um, or maybe snowy weather that covers up the road where you can't see the road very well or anything that's um, off a, a, a paved road, for instance. So in the near term, I think self-driving cars are going to be mostly restricted to those very known, very well-tested environments. Over time, I think we'll begin to see more self-driving cars that can serve as maybe taxis on a campus like Oak Ridge National Lab or the University of Tennessee or a campus that is very well known. You know, it's kind of interesting at UT, if you've been around, you see these little robots that are running around um, delivering food to students and staff and faculty on the campus. And these are little driverless vehicles that are going completely on their own. They're able to cross the street. They're able to um, avoid running into uh, pedestrians. On and that's the going on right now at the University of Tennessee. Right now. If I did go, not know that. Yes. If you go over to campus, you'll find these little, uh, short, small little um, vehicles that are really small um, with a little flag on them. And they're running around the sidewalks all the time right now. So this is an example. And they're delivering food to students and faculty. Absolutely. So you have a little app that you can go to if you're a UT student faculty or staff person you can order something from on campus like a restaurant the student sure union. and it um you know somebody will stick it inside the little vehicle and then it will come and deliver it to you and then you use your phone to open up the container to get your food out and to pay for it so that works and it works really well because the campus is very well structured it's mapped out to the smallest little detail and so those those little robots um, can can navigate that very effectively we're going to see the same thing do, do they do they go on the sidewalks or the streets they go on the sidewalks, except they have to cross the street sometimes. But so, they're not running into people. Nope. Right. They're, they're, they're actually watching for traffic. They use pedestrian walkways. They, um, you know, it, it is, it's fascinating. It's cool, though. I mean, it's really cool to think about. Yeah, it's really cool. So um, I, the, the challenge with driverless cars is that, you know, you might call it the last 5%, meaning anything that's unexpected, not planned out. Uh. That is where the driverless cars have a real problem. And so that's why I think it's going to be difficult to have these pervasively everywhere anytime soon because it, we get back to that point I made earlier about common sense. A lot of judgment is needed in unusual circumstances when mm -hmm. you're driving. Yes. It's hard to get that into an AI system in your vehicle. 
So this is something that um, lots of people are working on. So there's kind of two directions you could take with with uh, driverless cars. It, you know, one is what we have the, those kinds of capabilities we have in our cars now that are like driver assist. So you mentioned um, automatic parking or, you know, we've already talked about lane keeping and adaptive cruise control and those kinds of things. So you can continue to add on to that. And Tesla is doing this now. You know, you can have hands off um, segments, but of course you're supposed to be there paying attention. Um, so that's one direction, adding more of these features to cars that humans already drive. The other direction is when you just start with full autonomy and then you're a passenger. Uh, you're, you're not um, a, a, a driver who's sitting at the steering wheel. They already have these for taxi cabs in San, San Francisco, for instance. I have a good friend that lives out there, and she talked about her experience with uh, taking a driverless taxi cab uh, from place to place. So it works because they fully mapped out those areas of San Francisco, that, and they're testing them over and over and over yeah. and over. Then, then you have one thing that happens – but the reality is when we drive, things happen all the time. They do. And there's this sad- It's just if it happens in a driverless car, now there's you can point your finger and blame somebody, I guess. Right. You, you know, the, the motivation behind going toward driverless cars for many of the manufacturers is to reduce the number of deaths. Yeah, safety. Safety. People are, cause accidents all the time. You know, people drink and drive. Oh, um, zooming in and out of traffic. I mean, yeah. always trying to cut people off and it's just awful it's awful or you have to do a text while you're driving or something just silly like that so there are lots of accidents that are caused by people and the the thinking is that the um these driverless cars will be able to reduce that you know it's an interesting societal challenge though when you think about what is the level of accuracy or safety that you are willing to accept for our driverless car versus a human being and those are not the same we expect our driverless cars to be much more safe before we're comfortable with them compared to human drivers and it's a funny paradox it is isn't it i guess cuz then we're because we're not in control i guess ultimately is why we can't you know we're not in control of stopping something that could be bad that's right and i think so that is a, a really good point of getting familiar with these systems i think is an important part of acceptance we're visiting with dr lynn parker we're talking about artificial intelligence when we come back for our final segment i want to talk about the impact on business and the economy and also talk about the AI Tennessee initiative. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thanks for listening to More Living This Morning here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI as we've been visiting with Dr. Lynn Parker and talking about the impact of artificial intelligence. I do want to mention quickly my next class. It's actually at Pellissippi State Community College uh, at Hardin Valley. Thrive Financially in Retirement. It's a two-part class, October 17th and 24th. So again, October 17th and 24th, two uh, Tuesday evenings, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., two two two-hour sessions. You can get more information, including the syllabus, at PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. Again, that's PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. You can download the syllabus. You can also click to register directly with Pellissippi State. Artificial intelligence is all around us. It's exciting, but it also can be a little bit scary. I do, Dr. Parker, want to talk about the impact on business. AI is expected to contribute a significant 21% net increase to United States GDP by 2030, 21%. And the year-over-year gain from artificial intelligence um, compound annual growth rate of almost 20% is expected for the next 10 years, almost 19% per year. What sectors will experience the most gain, do you think, in AI adoption? Um, it's interesting. This summer, we actually did a study with some consultants about um, the economy of Tennessee and the areas where AI is uh, most likely going to have an impact, uh, particularly for the the uh, economic sectors that are important for Tennessee. And what we found through that is that uh, the manufacturing sector, the healthcare sector, 
IT and transportation and logistics were the areas where we anticipate more impacts of, of AI across Tennessee. I think, though, you'll begin to see these kinds of impacts in, in every economic sector, particularly those in the business processes of those sectors. So it's going to be pervasive. I don't think any sector is going to be uh, immune to these kinds of impacts. And, and in the business world, I see more and more focus on improving profit margin to inc- to increase the bottom line instead of having to just go out and create more top line revenue they want to create more margin and they're using ai to create greater margin and i think that's where a lot of business is heading um and believe it or not we talked about jobs new studies show that ai could in fact lead to the creation of around 97 million new jobs in the next three or four years that's that's a pretty big number 97 million jobs Talk to us, Dr. Parker, about the AI Tennessee Initiative. Sure thing. So at the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville, we're leading a new initiative called the AI Tennessee Initiative that has as its its top-level goal um, the objective of helping Tennessee to become a leader in the data-intensive knowledge economy. This is a segment of the economy that we're not particularly strong in, but um, AI, because it is having an impact across all economic sectors, is something that we need to engage with. And so we're doing this by identifying a number of, of actions and areas of emphasis in multiple areas, such as research, education, infrastructure for research and education, which means things like computation and data, um, and doing this, these efforts in partnership with businesses across the, country, across the state, um, with community organizations, with other academic institutions across the state, so that we can help uh, leverage the unique strengths of Tennessee and address the important challenges of the state of Tennessee so that, again, we as a state can become a leader in the data-driven knowledge economy. And w- w- with both the Oak Ridge Corridor and then also University of Tennessee, we really have an opportunity to be out in front with the technology and right here in Tennessee, right? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, if you look across the state of Tennessee, we have lots of pockets of excellence as it relates to AI. Certainly, you mentioned ORNL. They have an, an AI initiative. Of course, at UT we do. But you can look at lots of um, uh, uh, academic institutions, such including like UT Health Science Center, uh, Vanderbilt, other universities across the state. You can look at industries like VW here has a um, a, a tech um, automo- uh, a tech innovation center as well. So we have lots of pockets of excellence, but we don't necessarily have a common vision or a common direction. And so the AI Tennessee initiative is us at the University of Tennessee Knoxville embracing our land grant mission, saying we want to help not only our campus, but we want to help the state in these areas. And we're doing that pr- by providing the leadership and the strategic vision in collaboration with all of these partners, uh, both university and business partners across the state, to uh, to achieve those. those yeah, that's goals. great. Uh, how can people? We're about out of time, but how how can people follow the the AI Tennessee Initiative? Well, um, we have kind of a, um, right now, sort of a pared down website that has some information on it, but we will continue to populate that with more and more information, the AI Tennessee Initiative at UT. And that will be a way for people to kind of monitor um, what we're doing. And what is that website address? Um, well, if you go to, if you just, it's kind of a, uh, not that easy to find uh, with just the, the, the name of it, but just search for University of Tennessee. AI Tennessee Initiative, and you'll find it. There we go. Well, Dr. Lynn Parker, uh, quite experienced in the world of artificial intelligence, been at the University of Tennessee since 2002, served six years in Washington, D.C., including four years in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's just been incredibly informative and interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. It's great having you. Again, that's Dr. Lynn Parker, the AI Tennessee Initiative over at the University of Tennessee. Today, we've discussed innovation and technology because greater innovation can provide for more living, 
so you can live the best years of your life your way. Check us out online, broganfinancial.com. Click on radio for all of our podcasts. Kick on classes to learn of all of our upcoming adult education classes at both the University of Tennessee and Pellissippi State. Many thanks to Chris for engineering the show. Thanks to Jill for helping produce the show. Have a very blessed weekend. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.